So uh, it is my absolute pleasure to introduce first the director, Francis Lawrence. The producer, Nina Jacobson. And from the cast, Willow Shields. Sam Claflin. Jeffrey Wright. Julianne Moore. Donald Sutherland. Natalie Dormer. I know, right? Not the same. Liam Hemsworth. Are we in the same places as last time? Josh Hutcherson. And Jennifer Lawrence. Liam, I think you're my first one. Oh, oh. Please have a seat. <laughs> <laughs> Some things never change. <laughs> Francis and Nina, I want to start with you. Um, the third film, definitely less action-oriented, of course, because there's no arena scenes, but a lot more raw emotion, I found, in, in this third one. How do the two of you see this film in the overall context of the story? Um, well, I think, you know, this... this, this this half of Mockingjay is really about Katniss discovering what she means to the people uh, of all the districts and really sort of finally taking on the responsibility um, in her role in this revolution. Um, and it also gave us a, a chance to, op to, to explore the idea of uh, one of the facets of war, which is propaganda and the manipulation of images and the manipulation of both PETA and Katniss in that war of the airwaves. How about you? I also think that this movie is a, uh, it's a natural outgrowth of the events of the first two movies. And um, we try to always approach it as though if these events occurred, how would human beings actually react? And what would you go through if the demands that are placed on Katniss were placed on you? And um, how would you be after two, you know, wars slash games um, and knowing that now you're being put in a position to um, try to encourage your entire country to go to war um, and so we've just tried to keep it emotionally honest. And do we have Mahershala Ali? Ah, Mahershala Ali. <laughs> New cast member. <laughs> like, I see an empty chair. What is going on? <laughs> uh, you mentioned the, the propaganda, and that is one of the interesting things, these propaganda propos, the films that, that are produced, that Natalie, your character, produces. But Jennifer, what you're asked to do is be a bad actress in, these, in the, the first <laughs> took propos. took me a second Aren't to you? realize what you were talking about. Yeah. I was like, <laughs> whoa. I mean, um, Kat, Katniss was pretty horrible at those first ones. How, how did you get into the mindset of being a, a bad actress? Um, I didn't, thank you. Um, I, didn't, I didn't know. I, 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 it's, it's odd even just to act like you're acting in a movie, which I've never done before, um, and to act badly, but make it look, I mean, I, I don't know. I just kind of, I got nervous about that too, but then, you know, like the night terrors, I just showed up and Francis forced me to do it. And then, you know, we did, just did it. It's, it's, it's easy. Anybody can do it. <laughs> Josh, how did you find out that one of your moms from the, the Kids Are All Right was going to be President Coyne? Um, oh, that's weird. Uh, Come on, <laughs> Dave. <laughs> I, uh, it was funny. I, I, I found out, I think, like, you know, my mom or whoever saw like, the thing come through on the Internet told me, and, and I was like, oh, that's awesome. I had no idea something that was going to happen. Um, but when I first saw her on set, it was like, you know, you got elected. <laughs> Congratulations. It was really uncomfortable. Yeah, yeah. I know. Yeah, it wasn't really. <laughs> Where's mom number two? <laughs> Where's she? <laughs> no. Was... Maybe there's a part for Annette in the next one. Yeah, exactly. That's right. right. Yeah. In the next one. Uh, right. Do you know something we don't? Is well, there a fifth? Oh, you've already done. You've already done. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, Julianne, you have a 12-year-old daughter. Yeah, yeah, Are you I winning do. major cool points for being... In this movie? Oh my God. And a, and a son who's about to be 17. So he was the one who first read the books, actually. I bought him 
the, the third volume. I bought him Mockingjay in the bookstore. I'm like, I came home, honey, here's that you know, book from the series you like. Because <laughs> he was young at the time, you just want to encourage them to read what they love. And he adored it and was online for the first midnight show of Hunger Games in New York City. Mm. And then when my daughter read the books a few years ago, she was 10 when she started reading, I actually picked up her copy because we were on vacation and they were playing ping pong and I had nothing to read. <laughs> so I picked it up and I, I was like, these are amazing. I just tore through them. And then I called my manager to see who was playing coin. That's how it happened, I swear to God. <laughs> That's cool. <gasps> yeah. And Willow, you're a few months away from turning 15. Yeah. So you're approaching the age that Katniss is in the first book. Mm -hmm. Do you find that as the years have gone by that these movies are speaking to you personally more yeah. and more? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think it's cool to have grown alongside my character because I feel like as Prim has grown up, she's gotten stronger, like more like Katniss. And, and I feel like I've gotten stronger as a person too. So like to grow alongside my character has been really fun. And I think that, you know, I think Prim is kind of falling in Katniss's footsteps just in a, in a little bit of a different way, which is cool. And Sam, we talked about this earlier today, but Finnick is a very different guy in this movie than he was the last time. Like the mm. sheen is gone. He's a, he's a damaged dude. What, what was it like for you to, to play him in this different realm? Um, I think the way that I, the best example of like Finnick and his sort of journey, I guess, is, is he's very similar to Marilyn Monroe. <laughs> <laughs> but in a sense, in front of the cameras, like in, in public, he's a very, he, he is a character, he puts up a front, puts up a guard, you know, really allows himself to become someone completely different, but behind closed doors, he's damaged, he's vulnerable, sensitive, broken, in a sense, and I think, not that I kind of, you know, watched every Marilyn Monroe film in the world, but... Uh, <laughs> That, that definitely was something, you know, some inspiration to me, I guess. Um, that's incredible. So I think, <laughs> it's true. It's true. It's true. But, it's but, but um, you know, I think, I think <laughs> it really, it did really inform me uh, as to like what, what he would be like. And I guess this time around, you know, it is a very, very different approach to a character. But it's nice to be able to have the opportunity to show both sides of the coin, you know. Um, Wait, coin? Yeah. 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 <laughs> so, Donald, there's one great line that you have at a very pivotal moment, and it's so succinct, and you're just ruminating, and you say, referring to Katniss and what she's up to, moves and counter moves. In a way, I think that one line sums up the entire relationship between the two of you. What do you enjoy about the dynamic and playing it? Uh, well, I mean, that's, that's a chess game, and, and certainly with Katniss, uh, she's not actually playing chess, but um, she's making moves, and I'm playing chess with her. But um, it certainly doesn't define their relationship. It defines the activity of their relationship, but their relationship is one of someone who, at the end of his life, has been made aware of a particular kind of genius in the sense of Joan of Arc or Jesus Christ or whomever, you know. It's, it's, uh, Shaw wrote about it in his preface to St. Joan. Um, and to have this, it's very difficult to let it go. I mean, he has to destroy her, and he will, but, uh, but it's very difficult. Jennifer, you throw one arrow. What you love about the first movies were a lot of the action scenes as much as really trying to be physical. But in this one, you're acting more with your eyes, your face expressions. So how different was it from the previous two movies that you had so much action and not as much in this one and maybe even more acting? ¿Cómo fue hacer esta película en la cual en tus dos primeras cintas de los Juegos del Hambre Tienes muchas escenas de acción y en esta te limitas a tener más expresiones faciales, muchas menos secuencias de batalla. Please answer in Spanish. Sí. Yeah. En español. En español. Yeah, I wish I could just whip part? that out. That was so perfect. Um, yeah, there was a lot less action in these movies. Um, and, you know, she, she's in a, 
in a, a very different place emotionally at the beginning of these movies. She's um, been, um, the games have completely changed her. So it's not, she's kind of has to totally rebuild herself. So yeah, there wasn't as much action this time, more just kind of her reaction, I guess, to, to everything. The one arrow was. Uh, um, well, let, uh, I want to straighten something up. A lot of people think that I just that the arrow hit like a vulnerable spot on the hovercraft. It was an explosive arrow. Yeah. <laughs> we would never think that would be true, but anyway, uh, something yeah. we should know. Question here in the front row: the gentleman with the glasses, yeah, with the yellow shirt. Fire as well. Yes. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Bruce Kirkland from the uh, Toronto Sun in Canada. And I have a question in regards to the uh, political and social sophistication of these movies, just like there uh, was in the novels. So I'd be curious for Mr. Sutherland, Ms. Moore, and Ms. Lawrence to talk about it, because Donald, you're, you represent the extreme, and of course it's ironical because you're the most uh, humanitarian person I think I've ever met, but nevertheless, you represent fascism. Julianne, you represent freedom. And Jennifer, you're struggling between these extremes as the way for the uh, audience to identify with these issues too. So I'm very intrigued by the sophistication of a young adult series of films that has these issues. So I'd love to hear from the three of you on that. Well, as, well, well my version of being caught in between the two, as you say, I think, as you said, he's representing fascism coin freedom, only her version of freedom. Um, and Katniss is representing um, the consequences of war. It's not that she doesn't believe in what President Coyne wants. It's not that she doesn't believe that the capital is, is a um, terrible government that's only good for, you know, the 1% and blah, blah, blah. But there's, war is complicated. And um, it affects everyone on, on, on both sides. So I think uh, for Katniss, I, I think we have the two very strong points, complete opposing sides, and then the one person caught in the middle that's feeling the pain from both, that there really is no right way to start or end a war. I don't know. <laughs> well, and then a, at the end of all of it, I'm like, right, but I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but that's what fascinated me most about the books as a parent, because when I read them, I was really struck by the political allegory, and that's very unusual, obviously, in, in YA. Um, and, and they were, I was like, oh my gosh, these are, these are political books with adolescent overtones. So, and that's, a, and the thing about dystopia is that what, you know, what it posits is whether or not we have free will as human beings. And for adolescents in particular, that's a time when that idea is looming pretty large because you haven't had free will. You know, you're in your parents' house and you're looking to those next few years, you're going to be on your own and who you're going to be as a human being, what are your moral choices going to be, what are your romantic choices going to be. And so here you have the central character who's trying and decide who she's going to be personally and who she's going to be politically. And it's fascinating. It's, it's really, really wonderful. And then she also, Suzanne Collins also sets up this idea of the difference between what about freedom and totalitarianism, you know, and, and, how, and how you move from one political system to another. I think it's amazing and obviously speaks, you know, not just to me, but to <laughs> millions of people because it's been wildly successful. These are ideas that we all, I think, think about. The allegory is evident, you know, in the, uh, in the comparison with the United States. And when I first read the script, um, I truly wanted to be a part of this project so that I could look back at the end of my life, which is pretty close, and say, I was a piece of this. Because for me, how she has presented this dilemma to young people and demanded from them a resolution, demanded from them a participation that could change things. Because the, the world that my generation is leaving, everyone, is a disaster in every respect, you know, environmentally, politically, socially, economically. Um, 
so I, when I read it, I, I just begged to be a part of it, so that in the hope that it would be a, a catalyst for young people to get them off the, the seat of their pants that they've been sitting on for at least two generations, doing nothing. Uh, that, that somebody from somebody like Occupy or whomever use these films to generate from young people an energy that will take them into the voting booths in the United States in 2016 and make people responsible, politicians responsible for their words and their actions, to make them represent them. You know, it's, I hope somehow. Francis, by the way, a beautiful job shooting the movie. I thought it was unbelievable. Um, I'm sorry to follow that with such a goofy question, but I had all these serious questions written down, and I saw you um, on Fallon last night make a, a reference to how awkward the kissing scenes were in the film because they said you would chew garlic and, and onions before the kiss. I don't know but if there's any truth just behind that. Smell. <laughs> <laughs> no, I wouldn't say that. I just didn't think so much about the kissing, so I would just kind of eat whatever it was that I wanted to eat. She tell me what she ate, and then. I think Usually that the onions you're referring horrible. to was just, there I just had a sandwich with mustard and raw onions. Well, no, she'd say, yeah, she'd say it, but then she's like, and I didn't brush my teeth. So. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a fair warning. Yeah. <laughs> oh, uh, a serious question for you real quick. I love the line that Julianne Moore says in the movie. says, there's no progress without, without compromise. Uh, and I thought that was, it, yeah, there's no progress without compromise. I think it's a brilliant line. I'm wondering for you as actors in this business, how does that apply to you as an actor and taking on movies and, and having compromises in your own lives? Hmm. Hmm. I, mean, I think it's, I think it's a, there's no, not even progressing, there's no life without compromise. I think in everything you do, there's, there's some sort of compromise. Um, boy, I mean, I, I think that, that for us personally, there's, there's a fairly large sacrifice or compromise that happens um, with, with public attention or with a, a, a loss of anonymity when you go somewhere. Um, but uh, I don't know. What do, I mean, what do you think, Jen? I mean, the easiest way to say it. I think you should never compromise your passion. Yeah. yeah. No. <laughs> Hi, guys. Space. Awesome movie, first off. Thank you so much for giving it to us. Oh. Just amazing. Uh, if we could go down the road, uh, Liam, Jennifer, Josh, what quality does your character have that you wish you had that you don't have, and why? Uh, He's a pretty uh, he's a pretty brave guy. I would consider myself brave in some ways, but I think he acts impulsively and instinctively a lot. And I don't know. I guess you'd like to think and hope that you would act that bravely in that kind of situation. But I don't know. I haven't had to fight a war, so bravery. Gentlemen, <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty much the yeah. same. Yeah, I'd, I'd say that it's the same. All of us, right? No? Yeah, Compromisingly bravery? Yeah, I mean, I, I think, I mean, for me, I, I don't know what I would be like going through what PETA goes through, being tortured and brainwashed and everything, but I think that he fights his way back with the help of others and support of others, so his ability to fight through extremely adverse challenges, I think, is something that I admire. And you're definitely and I not that good of a baker. Yet. I'm not that good of, I'm not that good of a baker. <laughs> That's another quality. That's true. That's a good point. Baking. Baking is the quality that I wish I possessed. I do too. My first job was a baker. I used to make bread. He'll, there'll be so we many random things. Where, like, I was like flipping through a magazine the other day and he was like, I used to lay those kind of flows. <laughs> it's, like, it's like you've lived for a hundred years. <laughs> I'm, I'm an old, old soul. <laughs> Hi, uh, Josh, I can't, I can't help but think uh, it was like six years ago and I was talking to you about uh, uh, the um, journey to the center of the earth. Mm -hmm. And now my little 14-year-old niece is, uh, all she can think about is having your poster up on her wall <laughs> with, an, with an autograph or something. Uh -huh. How has it been to, for you and for Jennifer to sort of realize your dreams here? And uh, is success everything for both of you that you expected or thought it would be? Well, I never, I mean, 
how do I say this without sounding like a total idiot? I never had a plan or a goal. I've never really been a goal-oriented person in my life. So the idea of having success or being in a movie like this was never part of my plan, so to speak. My plan was always just to make interesting movies and work with interesting people and tell stories. And this fell into that category. So I kind of happened into this whole world just through my normal way of, of finding projects. Um, but it's been a big, big change. Um, you know, I, I, when I, Jen, Jen says that she, when she was offered the role, she like had a few days to think about it because she knew how much of a change it would be. I didn't really think about it at all. Um, I just knew that I loved the script, loved the story, and loved all the people involved. And so for me, I was just like, yes. And then later, it was like, oh my God, this is a big, big life change. Um, but it's like one of those things where until you lose it, you don't know how much, how important it is, or you can't really put a value on it. And by it, I mean anonymity. And once you lose that, and every restaurant you go into, people recognize you, and all of a sudden, you know that they know so many things about your life, true and not true. Um, and, and it's very, like, exposed. You feel very exposed everywhere you go, and it's a hard thing to wrap your head around, and, and it was never really a plan that I had in place for my life whatsoever. Yeah, it's a, certainly a blessed life. Um, but there are also sacrifices. Um, but you know, I get to do what I love, and there's a downside to every job. You, you, I think for me, it's like, like we have such great friendships and relationships, especially the three of us, that we came up in this together from the beginning, you know, and we kind of experienced this massive change as one, and, and, and we, there's not many people you can kind of relate to about this issue, and the fact that the three of us are so close, and we kind of all grew up in this sort of craziness together, I think helps a lot. Um, with us maintaining our sanity, more or less. Mm -hmm. But can I, can I talk about Josh, though, just because I did know him. <laughs> and, he ha and, and in my, you know, in my estimation, in my experience of him, he hasn't changed at all. He was, as, how old were you, 16? 16, yeah. But as a 16-year-old, he was exceptionally articulate and talented and had drive about what he wanted to achieve personally, the kind of work that he wanted to do. He'd already accomplished a tremendous amount. I realized that because I'd seen all of his movies <laughs> with my kids when he was a, when he was a child actor. Um, so I don't see, you know, what, what was great for me was to see this person who has, had grown up considerably, but whose personality and work ethic and everything had remained intact. So I think, you know, from, from in my view, it's been handled really gracefully by all of them. Okay, question right here in the front. Yeah. Mom. Hi. Oh. Caitlin <laughs> Cooper, really Hello. Love you guys. Um, you. We heard a lot of about the bumps and bruises, a broken hands here, a twisted knee here from catching fire. Can Nobody broke their hand. No? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, Sam did. But that was on catching so fire. Let's finish your question before you jump in there. Uh -huh. rash. So were there any for either Mocking Jay? Liam. Liam, Liam broke his ankle. <laughs> yeah, I had a, well, it was a hairline fracture. <laughs> <laughs> it was nothing to There's an ambulance. Still fucked the whole day up, whatever. Yeah, it <laughs> certainly did, didn't it? Yeah. Almost the rest of the shoot, too. Yeah. So we three weeks away from shooting. You knocked me out, man. Oh, One God. time, remember, you hit me in the side of the face with it. I felt really bad yeah. about that. That too. thing was hard. <laughs> yeah. I understand. I'd probably feel bad about it, too, if I were you. But you did it so many times, like, it was bound to happen. But, you know, it looks good on screen. And that's all that matters. <laughs> <laughs> the camera's are rolling. Yeah, exactly. Question right here. Wheelchair wheel. Hi, I'm Wheelchair. Allie, also with Teen.com. Um, you guys were just talking about your close relationship. So I wanted to know, the last day of filming, we saw some pictures that were like super emotional, everyone hugging. When you were getting ready to do that last day of filming, did you have like a mindset of, oh, this is going to be really emotional, this is going to be really this, and it, did it m meet your expectations? Did anything change? I think the last couple of weeks we started to realize that it was going to finish, and that was when, you know, because we'd been shooting for a year, and we were kind of ready to, you know, have a break and uh, yeah. Jennifer and I you know the last week we were shooting in, in, in Berlin we started to you know talk about the realization that it was going to end and and it was really emotional you know. The, the yeah it was complicated because it was such a long shoot it was you know we were there for 10 months um, and it, it was hard and exhausting so there was like a part of smelling the barn and you know wanting to wrap to see like we could give our bodies a break but realizing that when it was over we weren't gonna you know we always have that and then we and then we go and we do other stuff and then we come back and we have each other again and realizing that that was gonna be gone it was just so complicated it was such a 
complicated mix of feelings because it was like relief on one end because I mean, we were exhausted, but so sad to never, I mean, we're still best friends. We still see each other all the time, way too much. Um, <laughs> but, um, but, you know, but it's different. I mean, I've never, I've never had something, if all I had was, my, was this friendship with Josh and Liam, like, if that was all I ever got from this, I mean, I would be the happiest person in the entire world. They're my greatest blessing that I got to, you know, our lives changed together and we had each other. But having Francis as our director, who's like, I mean, he's just unbelievably talented and he's the nicest, kindest person in the world. And from the producers to the writers to the camera guys who were with us from the very beginning to the new cast that like everybody just really got along. So I've never seen anything like it come together so beautifully with no egos and no nothing. It was, it was sad to see that That's why we go. like to announce Hunger Games 5, 6, and 7. <laughs> I do. I would totally I do it. Yet, oh my God. <laughs> I don't know what happened web series. with the casting <laughs> or with what happened with this movie, but it really it was like a miracle yeah. with all of the people. So it was it was heartbreaking. You know, I, I thought I was going to be relieved because I was so tired, and then they called rap, and I just started sobbing. Yeah. Yeah. Question here. Hi guys, Dave Morales, Fox TV Houston. Uh, incredible films, incredible cast, and so my question is, uh, what do you want your legacy as a cast to be? What do you hope people say in ten years about? The Hunger Games. It was the best franchise in the history of the world. <laughs> <laughs> They're still <Just> rich. All right. Jennifer, I know in the film a lot of people look up to you as well as they do in real life. And I know you seem like a pretty normal person. What is that pressure like for you? Um, I, I have an amazing group of people around me that I make my world. I don't, I surround myself with no people and people who are constantly telling me no and stop acting like that and you look terrible. Um, <laughs> honest, positive. no, but <laughs> honest, <laughs> real people, you know, my, my publicists I've had since I was 16 years old, they've watched me grow up, they know me and genuinely do love me. I know that sounds crazy, but I, my agents I've had since I was 17. Um, I have an amazing group of friends that I, are not in the business that I've been friends with for years before any of this happened that I trust. Um, because something strange does happen that you don't expect when you become famous. It just, it's a very tiny thing that makes a big emotional difference. That I've, it's just the way that people look at you because I don't feel any different. And so sometimes when you go out and you're surrounded with a lot of, and you see the way that people look at you, it just kind of makes you feel alienated and kind of odd. So I try to surround myself with people who never look at me that way and never fake laugh at my jokes and keep me, <laughs> you know, um, it's funny because my friend is actually trying to email the interview to like find me an assistant. And one of the most important things, she's like, Jennifer hates fake laughs. <laughs> never chortle, <laughs> never, never fake laugh. Um, but yeah, I, I don't have fake people around me and Josh and Liam. <laughs> 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 Uh, it's so funny. <laughs> I'm going I'm to throw in a question for... Um, <laughs> I'm going to toss in a question for Natalie because I haven't heard from you yet. And I'm just so intrigued by the look of Cressida, particularly the shaved head and the tats. What was your first reaction when you saw maybe a sketch of what they were going to do to you? Uh, I, was really, I was really impressed in the amazing Oscar-winning... Uh, makeup designer V Neil, he's in the room, I believe. Yeah. He's here. V, wave. Yeah, v. Woo! Woo! <laughs> v uh, looks after Jen a lot, and uh, Jen and I were in the makeup trailer a lot together every morning, getting stuff done two hours. I was there when you shaved your head. You were. Yeah. I was like, dude, are you sure? Oh my god! Oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you were. Actually. Yeah, yeah, you were really supportive. Hair and makeup were very supportive. I mean, it's nice in uh, Mockingjay Part One because you meet members of Plutarch's underground. You meet people who are capital residents such as Cressida that do have the genuine political conviction to overthrow snow and tyrannical government. So I think that tattoo that Suzanne Collins came up with is a nice nod to that aesthetic past that uh, what you were saying about your um, about Peter's past and his family. Mm -hmm. I think there's a nice nod there to where Cressida comes from. But here's a bunch of people that are from the capital that want to join the freedom fighters and unite all the districts together to fight snow. So it was a nice aesthetic comment on the psychology behind her. 
Hi. Um, Meg Porter from Deco Drive, WSVN TV Miami. My question is for Jennifer and Josh. Both of your characters go through such emotionally devastating scenes. Mm -hmm. I, I would like to know how you prepared for that. And Jennifer, how did that compare to preparing for singing in the movie? <laughs> I don't know. We, we, I, we went about it in a, I mean, in a similar way where I read what's going on. I talk to Francis about it. We show up on set and then we try something. I mean, technically, that's how it was done. But, you know, I'm, I, as I feel like I've said it a million times, and, um, but it's still the same. You know, Katniss is um, completely stripped down and is in a completely different place emotionally at the beginning of these films and kind of has to rebuild to get back to the Katniss that I, and even I know, um, from the other two films. And that doesn't happen until, you know, halfway through the movie. But until then, she doesn't really know who she is. So kind of playing the same character that people recognize. But that's, um, I know, but it's very different. And um, yeah, Josh, take it away. Take it away. <laughs> um, should have interrupted me five seconds ago. I thought about it. I really yeah, did think I about it. I was like, I'm going to see where this is going. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Uh, oh, nowhere. <laughs> oh, nowhere. Should have jumped in. All right. Um, <laughs> Who would have thought? <laughs> yeah, I mean, for me, like, uh, I think the most important thing for me was, was really empathizing with PETA and sort of what he had gone through and uh, just really talking with Francis and really trying to understand what actual tortures went on and what the kind of lies that he's being fed about Katniss and the rebellion, what those were. Uh, understanding that was, was important for me. And... Um, I mean, yeah, that was really it. Just kind of talking with Francis about, about what PETA went through, I think, was, was the most important part in just understanding that. The tears were real, yes. <laughs> they were. I mean, once you're in that emotionally heightened state and you feel like you've lost everything and the one thing that you thought that you loved, you've been brainwashed to tell is like an evil monster, it, it's easier than you think to bring yourself to tears if you have any kind of empathy. I just hold my eyes open for a really long time. <laughs> <laughs> Are you going to do question number one or number two? They're both good. Number one, okay. Hi, my name is Noah Schachter, and I'm from Kids Day. Um, so this is directed to Jennifer. So I want to know, how do you think your character will inspire fans that are my age? Um, you are very well spoken. Um, I think that, uh, well, I hope that Katniss can inspire people your age by um, making this kind of younger generation realize how powerful your voice can be. And it's, and it's hard sometimes um, when a large group of people are kind of, you know, it's, it's easy to kind of follow the feet in front of you. Um, it's a lot harder sometimes to, to speak out. And so I hope that what you take away from Katniss is to be an individual, to think for yourself, and um, to not let other people think for you. Hi, I'm Christina Gibson with Cambio. Um, this movie is a lot darker than the first two, so I was wondering how did you guys keep it fun and light on set in between takes when you weren't in these heavy scenes? The question I, I, is how th did we not... keep the movie dark and heavy? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that's the opposite. I mean, quite, quite honestly, this, this group in, I have to say with everybody involved, I'm, People are able to turn it on and off. Uh, it always stayed really fun. It really, it really did, and uh, and everybody was really good about that. So there was no sort of dwelling in the in the mood or the emotion of any scene. There's actually a really terrific Jen at one point wanted to see a blooper reel because there's a lot of fun stuff <laughs> happening around on set, and the editors put something together that I had never seen before. It was a string of the moment action was called, <laughs> uh, strung together back to back. And it was just insane to see everybody go from kind of laughing, cracking jokes, and then you hear action, and they go and right into the scene, just in the moment, every one of them. And it was incredible to see just that instant change. Um, and it was kind of a lucky thing that for all of us, people were able to, to turn it on and off. Um, I've got a question for Sam Clayton. Um, so Phoenix character has been performing for the Capitol a lot longer than Katniss was. Um, and he gets kind of a real cracker of a monologue in this film, uh, where I think all of the pieces sort of come together in a very short period of time. I wondered if you could talk about, you know, he's sort of experiencing like a little bit of a re revenge in that speech, as well as he's trying to protect someone, um, and all the pieces of his character are kind of coming together there. Well, I think, I think that's, 
throughout this sort of film, um, Finnick grows in confidence, and you start seeing the, the sort of uh, the glint in his eye come back from the you know the charming, beautiful man that he was in the last one. Um, <laughs> but, um, so, so I think it's it's his confidence is back. He's he's ready to fight for what he believes in. He realizes that he's not a lone wolf. That he has Katniss to look to to kind of um, to be inspired by. Um, you know, she's sort of thrust into the limelight immediately after kind of going through this traumatic experience, whereas he's left to wallow in his own self-pity. Um, but I think, I think he realizes that, yeah, he has something to fight for, uh, that he can make a change. And something that he is able to do is trying to recruit um, and, and sort of symbolically, is that a word? I don't know. Yes. I like it. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go with it. <laughs> um, symbolically, kind of, uh, yeah, uh, recruit new newbies, um, and it's it's a, obviously a, something that BT does is is able to kind of um, what's the word distribute this message to all of the uh, all of the districts, and therefore it's you know obviously an important message and an important moment in Phoenix's life, I guess. Uh, Ismail from the Huffington Post French edition. I wanted to know, uh, Jennifer, how, um, how are you linked with your character because uh, she's the center of, of, uh, of the intention and in your career you are also the center of the intention. How, how do you feel connected with her? Um, the, I always get nervous kind of making comparisons because Katniss is the leader of a rebellion that changes the world um, and I'm you know, just chilling. A clown. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> We're clowns. <laughs> and I'm, yeah, I'm a pawn on a chess board. Uh, oh, well, that is there you go. very similar. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> I'll take this one. Thank you, Natalie. Nice. <laughs> I'll take this one because I stood next to Jennifer Lawrence for nine months as an actress watching another actress, and I stood by her as Cressida watching Katniss. Uh, Jen was saying that um, Katniss doesn't have any ego, nor does Jennifer Lawrence. And um, the reason that Katniss is uh, so compelling to an audience and charismatic is because she's true to herself and she doesn't suffer the bullshit, the BS, and the superficial elements. Um, you, and you just said it yourself, you know, think for yourself, act for yourself. Jen's getting that reputation as a young actress and she deserves it and that's why people look up to her. She's a great role model, and so is Katniss Everdeen. They're simpatico in that, so she, and she can't comment on that herself because by the very nature of her personality, she wouldn't, so. <laughs> Thank you. Good job. Good. Yeah. 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 Here. Yeah. Um, she does have a sequel in your rebellion plan as well. Yeah. <laughs> I, do. I do. I don't know what it's going to be about, but it's brewing. Seems good. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm Casey Baker from People Magazine. I um, brought my 12-year-old to see the movie last night and we loved it, so well done, congratulations. Um, for Jennifer and Liam, um, what is something you learned about yourself from the very beginning or about each other that maybe surprised you? Something I always learned from Jim was, you know, to stay in the moment and, and be honest and, um, you know, never change for the wrong reason, reasons, you know, just be yourself. That was something so great that I always noticed about Jam was no matter what, she was just herself and she was honest and, you know, she enjoyed what she was doing and, and she was happy in the moment. You know, and I think that's why she's a great actress is because she adapts to a situation so easily. Thanks. Yeah. Welcome. God, this is like the best press conference ever. Yeah. <laughs> Natalie, do you have anything to say? <laughs> um, um, I don't know. I mean, Liam, I, I, I guess the thing that surprised me, I would never expect um, to ever have a man this good looking ever be my best friend. I would just never assume those things could happen. Um, um, but he is. He's the most wonderful, lovable, like f just family oriented, sweet, <clears throat> hilarious. Um, he's amazing. And he, he actually taught me how to be fair, but to stand up for myself. That's like my biggest weakness is, is with, with all movies, with negotiating, with just kind of anything, or with people. Um, I, 
am a wimp about standing up for myself. And Liam is always fair. He's always on time. He's always doing his job. Um, but he's really good about, you know, making sure that everything stays fair. Whereas I like used to let people walk all over me. But, you know, he's kind of teaching me to like toughen up a little bit, which is important. And I needed that. Thanks, buddy. Thanks. Yeah. Well, before we finish up, what Herbie Moreau from Bell Media Canada, Jennifer, here. What was the most difficult scene you had to play in the movie, and what is the most uh, enjoyable scene you had to do? Uh, most difficult scene was singing. Um, <laughs> most enjoyable scene. Um, why, why is all why is all the water stuff in my oh, no, another movie? Um, no, no. Second movie. Uh, most enjoyable yeah, scene. When we're all together, no, like the whole um, cast. Yeah, when we're all together, obviously. But I was just thinking, like scenery, because normally when we're all together, we're doing something miserable. Um, <laughs> what? We are. We're like in like the boardroom with like the fluorescent lights, and it's like ah, where's outside? Um, but we had to do a scene in a meadow that was really beautiful. I got a good selfie of me peeing in it. Um, <laughs> Um, but, but actually the board, yeah, the control room was kind of fun. It was just a really cool set and yeah, and we were, we're all together except for you. Oh God, actually worse than the singing was when I had to watch those videos of Josh like <laughs> over and over and yeah. over again. Oh my God, it was like 15 or 20 times. I was like, I get it. Just put on a piece of tape and I'll start crying. I swear, I swear, <laughs> I'll do it. I can't watch my baby in pain this much. <laughs> I thought you were saying it was such bad it acting. Was. <laughs> no, I couldn't bad bear acting. to watch it No, more. just the same thing over and over again. And they were so long. And like I started I memorizing. At one point, I thought I was like mouthing along with you about, yeah, I was just like, oh, it was miserable. <laughs> uh, any, any scene where you're eating? OK, I'll stop. I've answered your question. 